in this episode of Pass Blast Gaming, we're going to be winding back to the year 2000 with the release of Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine on the Nintendo 64. A re-release of the 1998 PC game, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine was an action-adventure game hyped to be the Nintendo 64's answer to Tomb Raider, and for many is one of the last exciting third-party releases for the N64. However, as the sixth generation of consoles started to wind down, and with a low-key limited release exclusive to North America, the Infernal Machine eventually fell off most gamers' radars and was quickly forgotten. We're going to be looking back at the history of this game, its interesting release, and of course, how the game holds up by today's standards. The game takes place in 1947, nine years after Indy rode off into the sunset at the end of The Last Crusade. World War II is over, Nazis are no longer a threat to the world, but the Cold War era has begun and there's a whiff of danger in the air as the Red Army have found something in the desert ruins of Babylon that could tip the Cold War in their favour. The Mysterious Infernal Machine. Long story short, the game takes players across a globe-trotting adventure spanning 17 unique levels, searching for artifacts, solving puzzles and fighting Russians. Initially developed by LucasArts and released for the Windows operating system, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine had a lot of potential, with reviews praising its story, level design and music, however the final ship product was a bit of a letdown due to its game crashing bugs and frustrating gameplay mechanics that were set back by its primitive keyboard controls. Despite this, the game's potential must have been noticed by top executives at LucasArts, as the game eventually found new life on the Nintendo 64, with LucasArts commissioning not just a straight port of the game, but a version that was rebuilt and optimised specifically for the Nintendo 64. Factor 5, the team best known for their Star Wars games including Rogue Squadron and Battle for Naboo, were assigned with the task of optimising the game for the Nintendo 64, ensuring that issues that plagued the PC version were ironed out and frustrating gameplay mechanics and poor controls were completely overhauled, taking reference from modern 3D platform games at the time. With the development of just under two years, hype for the revamped Nintendo 64 version was high, with many claiming it to be the Nintendo 64's answer to the PlayStation's Tomb Raider. At the time, comparisons were drawn between the two games, and it's safe to assume that the Infernal Machine drew heavily from Tomb Raider, which in itself was a clone of the Indiana Jones franchise. Despite the optimism for the game, and the extensive media coverage, not to mention a demo on the E3 show floor, interest in the game eventually fizzled as the game drew closer to release. And why is that? Well, just prior to the game's release, LucasArts announced that the Infernal Machine would be released in December 2000 as a rental exclusive at Blockbuster Video Stores. Welcome to Blockbuster Video! As part of this agreement between LucasArts and Blockbuster Video, the game would only be made available for rent from Blockbuster Video Stores in the United States, with the option to purchase exclusively online from the Blockbuster and the LucasArts website. These were the early days of e-commerce and internet shopping was still a bit of a niche. The blockbuster deal combined with zero marketing resulted in a low key release. So why did LucasArts do such a deal in the first place? There could be several reasons for this. The year 2000 was an interesting time. Gaming was in a bit of a crossover period. We had already seen the release of the PlayStation 2 in North America and Europe, the Dreamcast was on life support, and the Xbox and GameCube were both on the horizon. We were well and truly into the next generation of consoles, while the PS1 and the Nintendo 64 were coming to the end of their life. And not to mention, two other big Nintendo 64 titles were also to be released at the same time as the Infernal Machine. I'm talking about Banjo-Tooie and The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. The risk of releasing a game at the end of a console's life while also going into the holiday season against two high-profile games might have caused LucasArts some panic at the prospect that their game could be overlooked by gamers, especially given some of the gameplay design issues in the final game, which we'll discuss later. Of course this is all just my own speculation, but if LucasArts did have little faith in their game, it is plausible that the blockbuster deal may have been an attempt to recoup some of the development costs, and perhaps even break even once online sales and rentals had been exhausted. Of course, a consequence of all this was that the PAL version was inevitably cancelled. There was talk about a PAL version being released in 2001, but this of course eventually faded. And with the new consoles on the way, it didn't seem like anyone really cared. So did gamers miss anything by not playing the Infernal Machine? Is the game worth shelling out that kind of cash in 2023? Well, let's take a look and see. Upon launch, players are presented with the title screen featuring original artwork by Drew Strozen, famous for the iconic posters of the original trilogy. Overlaid with this is a classic John Williams indie theme in all its midi glory. 
Players select to begin a new game which launches an introduction montage summarising the Cold War era that the game takes place in, setting the tone before eventually throwing players into the first level of the game. The first level plays very much as a tutorial for the player, introducing them to the basic control scheme and gameplay mechanics before delving into the game's narrative. This is important as in the Infernal Machine there are no hints or direction given to the player, leaving it up to them to figure out where to go and how to approach each of the puzzles. The game spans 17 levels with each level bringing its own unique design, puzzles and gameplay which takes players across various archaeological sites across the globe. There is definitely a sense of indie adventure in the Infernal Machine as you'll climb, crawl, swing and shoot your way through each level, uncovering alternate paths, hidden treasures, go head to head with the Red Army and at times even branch out into more recreational activities such as water rafting and desert jeep riding, breaking up the linear structure to the levels. Exploration and puzzles play a large element in the game, with each level featuring unique sets of puzzles that the player will need to figure out in order to progress. Some of these range from fairly straightforward to inducing many rage quits. For the most part, the puzzles are fairly satisfying to complete, but for someone who would rather a more action-oriented game, they might be a little bit disappointed with this. But in saying that, combat is a large element in the game, and players have various choices at their disposals including whip cracking, hand-to-hand -hand fist fighting, and the occasional shootout. This is all very reminiscent of the action scenes in the movies. Graphically, the game looks pretty decent for its era. Many of the environments are quite open with long draw distances, however you'll notice that some of the rendered objects do pop in and out of view randomly. This looks to be more like graphical glitches rather than a limitation with the 64 hardware. The game also claims to use the 4MB expansion pack, and while maybe it's arguable, it does appear to run at a slightly higher resolution than with the standard 64 jumper pack. However, any difference is negligible when running on a high definition TV. You'll also notice that the minecart level is locked for players running the game without the expansion pack, which probably is no surprise as it's one of the more complex levels as far as on-screen elements and enemies are concerned. I wouldn't go as far as saying missing out on the minecart level totally ruins the experience of the game, but it is a bit of a shame as it's probably the most memorable level as it feels like a bit of a callback to the Temple of Doom. The character models are low poly, which is not unlike any other games of its era. However, making up for this is the extra care taken for the texture details such as creases in clothing and sweat stains adding to the overall immersion of the game. And look, Indy even has hat hair. The only major issue with the graphics are that the animations are rather stiff, with Indy looking like he's got a shit in his pants. The overall stiffness of the animation is especially jarring given how slow Indy's movements are. It almost looks as though the developers had trouble animating and just wanted to get away with the bare minimum, as some of the animations are reused during cutscenes or avoided altogether. Look at that little wheel spin! Also I noticed for whatever reason lip syncing during cutscenes has been removed from the 64 version, which is a little bit disappointing. But those things aside, it's hard to find a Nintendo 64 game which looks better than the Infernal Machine. On a surface level, the gameplay of Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine is rather fun. However, unfortunately there is an issue which really taints the game and which no doubt is going to turn off a lot of gamers. I'm talking about the controls. Right off the bat, the controls aren't great. This is where players may choose to give up on the game entirely, and to be honest I wouldn't blame them. Maneuvering Indy around the 3D environment does flow quite nicely, especially compared to the PC release. However, having Indy perform simple actions such as jumping across a cliff, climbing a ladder or ledge, or interacting with an object isn't as seamless as one would expect even for a game of the 90s. In order to have Indy perform a basic maneuver, the player must align Indy in a very specific spot for the game to recognise the action that the player is wanting to take. I need to line myself up here. I'll just aim this tin fish over here. This forces players to have to slow down or stop entirely to try and place Indy in such a position where the game will recognise and follow through with the command that the player is trying to make. This is a little bit hard to describe and it's much easier to understand if you actually play the game. This unfortunately breaks up the flow of the game and can become quite frustrating, especially when enemies are nearby attacking you. Making it even more tedious is there is also a delay between the player selecting the action button on the controller and Indy actually performing the action on screen. While I found myself adapting to this delay over time, it definitely impacts the thrill of the combat. 
I also found myself feeling cheated at times, as most deaths incurred in the game were a result of clumsy controls rather than of my skill level. Although I'm sure that's arguable. A positive to the controls is the Z-locking system that was implemented by Factor 5. The Z-locking makes for a huge improvement over the PC version, which originally, at least from what I played, seemed to have no locking system so players had no idea what they were shooting at. However, in the 64 version, switching between enemy targets is seamless and works rather nicely, clearly inspired by the two 64 Zelda games. Speaking of Zelda, you'll notice that the weapon and item assignment config in the upper right corner of the screen very much bear a resemblance to the Zelda games. In the Infernal Machine, players assign weapons and items to each of the C buttons. However, unlike in Zelda where players can trigger the use of those items by pressing any one of the C buttons that the items are mapped to, in the Infernal Machine, these C buttons act more like hotkeys for the quick mapping of items and weapons to the B button. So basically, to use an item, you have to pause the game, open up your inventory menu, which is super slow by the way, find the item and assign it to a C button. Then unpause the game, select the item with that C button, which then assigns it to the B button. Now you can use the item. Overall, it just feels very clunky and extremely slow. Considering the limitations that Factor 5 must have had with modifying an already completed base game, they've done a pretty decent job, all things considered. In my opinion, a game like Jet Force Gemini is far less forgiving when it comes to the controls, which I'd even go as far as to say is unplayable by today's standards. Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine is slightly more forgiving, but it is asking a lot from the player. While the controls are a nuisance, if you persevere and learn how the game recognises commands, and accept that this isn't going to be free-flowing like Uncharted, the game can become rather enjoyable. You definitely got to switch off what you know about modern 3D adventure games, as the game is definitely not the fast-paced action-adventure game that you'd expect. You got to take it slow, but once you work it out, things become easier and the gameplay is more enjoyable. So as a final point, let's talk about the music. The game's musical score is composed by Clint Byarkin, which I'm sure I butchered, who has done a great job of replicating the tone and feeling of John Williams' style, but making it unique to the Infernal Machine, clearly taking inspiration from Russian-styled classical pieces. The voice acting in the game is decent for its era. The obvious standout is Indy's voice actor, who is a dead ringer for Harrison Ford. Don't call me Junior. Don't worry, Sophia. I'll think of something. I hope. So now that we've come to the end of this video, how well does the Infernal Machine hold up by 2023 standards? Well, there's no deluding ourselves that the controls are the biggest turnoff for this game. And despite the improvement over the PC version, the game still feels clunky as hell and will leave you pulling your hair out at times. So don't feel bad if you pass on this game. Now, if you do want to give it a go, I wouldn't recommend paying the inflated prices that you see online. But if you are an indie fan and you can snag yourself a cheap copy of the game, then by all means, give it a go. But if your only means to play the game are to pay a ridiculous amount of money or buy the discounted PC version on Steam, I'd say give it a pass. The Infernal Machine truly has the potential and there is a good adventure game to be found somewhere in here. It just takes a little digging to find it.